join um, a little later whenever they can. So um, just, um, yeah, just proceed with your talk um, as you were going to. Um, so welcome, everybody. Um, it's the 36th session um, of Eurasian Online Seminar with Professor Makan Lal. Um, and it's organized by the Department of International Relations and International Laboratory on World Order Studies and the New Regionalism of the National Research University Higher School of Economics. Um, and he is our guest today, Professor Makan Lal. The topic of his lecture is India in the Contemporary World. Professor Makan Lal is a distinguished archaeologist, historian. He taught at Banaras Hindu University and Aligarh Muslim University before moving to Delhi in 1998 as founding director of Delhi Institute of Heritage Research and Management. He was also senior fellow and then distinguished fellow at the Vivekananda International Foundations New Delhi, a leading independent think tank in India. Professor Makan Lal was the first Charles Wallace fellow at Cambridge University and senior fellow at Clare Hall. He was elected by the South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation Countries, archaeologists and historians to represent South Asia on the executive committee of the World Archaeological Congress um, that ran from 1986 to 1994. Professor Makan Lal was the academic program coordinator and treasurer of the World Archaeological Congress held in Delhi in 1994. Professor Lal has also been associated with a large number of academic bodies um, on the editorial boards and also as editor of academic journals. Um, Professor Lal has published 18 books and about 200 research papers in national and international journals on Indian history, archaeology um, and civilization. He's a regular contributor to various newspapers on current affairs, and some of his books are Rise of Civilization and the Ganga Yamuna Dub, Archaeology of Population, Ancient India, India and the World in Ancient Times, Educating to Confuse and Disrupt, History of Jana Sang, Gandhi's Assassination, What the Documents Say, and Secular politi Politics, Communal Agenda. Um, he is also co-editor of the first five volumes of the 11-volume series on History of Ancient India, being brought out by Vivekananda International Foundations. In recognition of his outstanding academic works, Professor Makanlal has been awarded Jawaharlal Nehru Senior Fellowship, which he is expected to join soon. Um, thank you very much, Professor Lal, for um, joining us today. Um, I think most of the participants are familiar with the format of the seminar. Um, at the beginning, we're going to have a talk, um, which um, is going to um, last for about 45 minutes to 50 minutes. Um, and then we're going to have a Q&A session. Um, we're not very strict about the limit, um, as I already told Professor Lal, um, so you can go on for um, as long as you're comfortable with. Um, and um, the Q&A session is going to be at the end, and if you want to, um, if you'd like to ask a question or comment on Professor's talk, um, please um, either put your name down in the chat um, as well as a question and I'll read it out, um, or you can also just raise your hand um, and comment um, after the uh, presentation. Right, Professor Lal, floor, the floor is yours. Um, we very much look forward to what you have to say to us today. <coughs> Thank you very much for your very kind introduction. I feel very flattered, but at the same time feel a bit embarrassed, but I didn't deserve to be mentioned all that. It has been all part of life and I have taken it very normal way. Well. Let me express my gratitude to the Department of International Relations, International Laboratory on the World Order Studies, and the new realism of the HSC University. Particularly, I would like to thank Professor Alexander Lukin for inviting me to deliver this prestigious talk. And I, I fully understand the honor I have been bestowed upon, and I shall always cherish it as one of the best thing to happen in my life to be invited on this lecture series. <clears throat> I will keep in mind as a university teacher, I have always stick to time to the extent that I told my student all the time, if I am two minutes late, take it that I'm not taking class because I am the, either I'm late in a, some meeting or I'm on leave. So don't wait more than two minutes. And I have done that always five minutes earlier, finish my lecture. I'll try to finish it in 40 minutes so that I leave more time for Q&A. And uh, let me say 
my dear friends and professor lukin this this lecture i have taken the liberty to speak to you and your colleagues because of two very simple way my own experiences <clears throat> traveling around for international conferences to various places and that experience will get reflected over here and second thing was talking to various academics and also hearing to lot of sermons you know not reflected on you at all you are one of the those serious scholars who have never believed in giving sermons but i i have heard a lot about it at various places so this lecture is very much part of that whole experience and what i have experienced and i can frankly share with you professor looking being a good understanding friend <clears throat> so much little is known about india in western academia and i'm not being patronizing i'm not accusing anyone maybe interest lies little bit less or maybe another aspect is so much little is known it because <clears throat> what i have found in western academia mostly they read themselves or their friends they don't read anything written by india uh, written by indians about india so that gives a big gap very big gap in understanding and that is why when i gave you the title about india in the contemporary world i thought that how to place india in the contemporary world where you can put it and you can understand it in better way and in order to do that you need to have a cut off cut off line from where you can see below and you can see above to judge where finally one has reached same is applicable on in india you have to have some kind of thing a datum line from where you can start thinking where we have gone in the among the comity of nations and how we have fared when people talk in western academia there are a lot of intellectuals who are who claim themselves to be expert on india and i don't say that they should not claim they can claim very well but at the same time they start comparing with the west and western standard without realizing the differences in civilizational approaches the differences in their political structure in their social structure in their religious life and that is why i feel something needs to be very clearly spoken <clears throat> and to begin with let us see what happens in the 18th century when british come to india i will come at the end on the various present day politics present day international affair but i think it has to be put in perspective when british came to india in 18th century india's trade was india's share in the international trade was 26% and remember when i am giving all these figures i am not giving it from my pocket i am not giving back in from my library i am giving it all the figures come from british economists themselves or american economists who have worked over a period of time so when british came india's share was 26% and that was in the beginning of 1800 and first decade you can take 1801 to 10 but when they leave india in 1947 after 150 years india's share in international trade comes down to one less than 1% so from 26% we are down to 1% india and when i am talking about india remember pakistan and bangladesh also part of that huge thing in 1820 india gdp was 16% of the global gdp again the figures from oxford university by 1870 it has come down to 12% in 70, in 60 years 1820 it was 16% of total gdp of the world by 1870 it comes down to 12% and by 1947 when we british leave india's gdp is just 4% of the global gdp 
I think these are the figures that you have to keep in mind. <coughs> then, I mean, these are broad pictures I'm going to give you so that it can be understood where we started, where we were, where we were left, and where we had to start again. British enforced taxation, sorry, British expo imposed tariff duty on export import by Indians 70 to 80%. Imagine all the trade that was being carried out by them that they had the will. But if Indians were doing any business, international trade, 70 to 80% duty. Taxation in 17th century, 18th, 18th century till end of 18th century was only 5% on Indian. 5% of the total produce, whatever income you had, right from family to business to everybody. But, sir, within by 1820s and 30s, taxation goes to 50% on Indians. Imagine your salary gets 5% tax, but suddenly you have to pay 50% of your entire income. Well, just one or two things more. <clears throat> Share in the world economy. Before British, in the entire world economy, in 17th century, it was 27%. As I said, all these are figures from various books published by OUP. And by 18th century beginning, it comes down to 23%. So 4% comes down, it's all right. But lo and behold, when British left India in 1947, the GDP share comes down to 2%. Imagine, from 27%, India's GDP comes down to 2%. And when people talk about great British contribution on the development of India, I fail to understand where that development was. And within this period, from 1820 to 1947, British GDP rose from 2.9% to 11. 8%. So from 3%, they went to 12%. And from 27%, we came down to 2%. And one of the best lines that have been, say, let me quote, you have, may have heard a, a scholar called Sashi Tharoor, who was uh, in UNO and now Indian scholar. What is the reason for all these things that is happening? The reason is simple. India was governed for the benefit of the Britain. India was governed for the benefit of Britain. Britain's rise in 200 years was financed by Indian resources and at the cost of Indian's economic health. So, when we India got freedom finally, we had no industry worth name. We had no economy worth name. We have no institutions worth name established by British and how to deal with it. And from there, let us begin India's journey in the world today where we stand. When India was looking for freedom, asking for freedom, very patronizingly, Western intellectuals, Western intellectual does not include, fortunately, Russians. They have always been very sympathetic to us and imperialist, I will call them, if you don't mind. Politicians, historians, intellectuals predicted disintegration of India. That was the first thing they predicted. Why you are asking for freedom? You will not survive even 10 years. You will disintegrate. You have more than 400 languages spoken. You have more than 500 states. They said you have more than at least 150 cultural levels. How you are going to manage? Always said, leave us alone and you will see. 
British Parliament discussed and passed the resolution that India as a country, as a nation will not survive because of the contradictions within. And they were very proud in saying that we have managed to hold them together. And they also said that our entire work keeping India together will go waste if we give freedom. Now just look at us. After 75 years, since 1947, we have remained one. But look at Europe itself. What has happened to Europe? Since 1947, 1946, has, have, have not many countries in Europe disintegrated, dismantled, whereas they did not have as much diversification, cultural, religious, uh, language, linguistics, food, and everything. And that is where I would like to say the first thing you have to think about when you think of India, think what was predicted in 1946, 1947, think where we are today, despite all the predictions that it will not survive even in 10 years. And Imagine one thing, also look around us and look around in the world. In, 19, in last 75 years, which country has remained so deeply ingrained in democratic traditions and not at all wavered from its path? Look at it, look at nearby India itself, Look at around the world. Are there countries who have been able to hold on to democratic traditions and not being disturbed even once? In 1975, except for two prime ministers, Jawaharlal Nehru and Lal Bahadur Shastri, all other 14 prime ministers were elected or defeated on the ballots. There was no forced, you know, forced implied to get the chair vacated. More than 125 chief ministers from various states were changed through ballot. And I must say with a lot of pain that instead of getting much support from great democratic countries or those who peddle democratic values a lot, they have never been of great help to us. In many ways, we have been made to suffer and look at the way whom they have supported. They have always supported dictatorship. They have always pulled down democratic values. They have always pulled down democratic governments. So please, when you think of today's India, do think what was pronounced, what was said, how we have been able to come in 75 years, changing prime minister after prime minister, electing government after government, and each and every vote is respected and counted for. Despite all the harassment that we have gone, also, India has always been accused of caste system, and many of them have tried Many of them have tried to link it to racism. You as a scholar, you know that such of things are all part of the academic academia. But India is the only country which can proudly claim, proudly claim that each and every position has been held by each community, minorities, Hindus, minorities, even the lowest minorities. Six have been prime minister as well as president and vice president in this country. Muslims have been president, vice president. They have been chief justice of India, chief of defense staff, chief of you know various other things. You can imagine IB. Intelligence Bureau is one of the most sensitive position in any government. And the moment any new government comes, it would like to have its own person as IB chief. But in 1940, 2014, when Modi came, 
IBT was a Muslim. Modi did not remove him. Worked with him for 10 remaining months of his tenure. I think these are things that have to be understood very clearly that imagine Zoroastrians, Parsis, you may have heard of this name, Zoroastrians. In India today, total population of Zoroastrians is just about 50,000. In terms of ele electoral politics, they have no role. 50,000 in a population of 100, uh, a billion, 1.4 billion, 50,000 doesn't matter, 0.00001%. But still, we have had from that community, Army Chief, Chief Justice of India, Attorney General of India, one of the Attorney General is known as Mr. La. That kind of honor has been bestowed upon all the communities. So we have taken care of all the communities, all the religious communities, minorities communities, and today, or maybe in the last several times, Mr. Aiken Narayanan, a great famous diplomat, he came from very downtrodden community deep south. Today's president, present president, Murmu, Mrs. Murmu, she comes from a tribal area and she was the first girl to go to school in her village. Can you imagine? Today, we are very proud that our president is a person who was the first girl to go to school from her village and surrounding area. That's the kind of social milieu we have adopted. That's kind of things we do. And that is why all those who predicted that India will fall under its own social, religious, and linguistic weight have failed completely. Today, I will be coming a little bit on that, but you know that these things you may not have known better, but you know better today how India is faring, what is India's position in the world today. But I'm giving you the background from where we have started, from where we came. <clears throat> In 1947, we could not make a decent needle. We could not make a decent blade. Leave what to say anything else. Now you know where India stands, be it heavy industries, be it machines and tools, be it textiles. We make one of the best textile, the very same textile industry that was destroyed by British in order to save Manchester. India paid a heavy price for that, very heavy. And even today, you may be knowing that best cotton clothes come from India and Bangladesh. Because in British time, Bangladesh was also India. So you can easily say in entire world, the best cotton clothes, best silk clothes were supplied by India. And that entire industry was destroyed. Millions of people died of hunger because they had no work. No work means no earning, no income. But that is where we were. But today, right from heavy machinery tools to everything else we are making during British time, only thing we were making is ordnance factory guns and guns. That is all. Nothing else was being made in India. But today, <clears throat> right from heavy machinery, TIFR to all that. More than 90% villages and cities were dark when British left in India. When I say 90%, meaning there was no electricity. There were no resources to fight them. Today, more than 90% are in the light, other way around. Leave alone that kind of achievement. But there is something called nuclear physics. There is something called nuclear reactors. We have our own entire nuclear system. We have our own space research system. And in that, we do not owe anything to Western world except some help from Russia. They did help us. Otherwise, it was absolute big no from entire developed world. 
if they want to call themselves developed and if that is the way to consider not civilizational value development but money development they are free to call it but today we have one of the best research centers tata institute of fundamental research bhava atomic research center indian space research organizations they have put india right at the top bracket beat nuclear physics beat space research organizations and you know certain recent development where india launched multiple satellites at the same time that was a big achievement of india things there was something called supercomputer in 1980s olga you are too small in those days to remember there is something called supercomputer and lot of debate was going on in 80s and 90s you will not believe and my friends all of you know america and the western world refused to give a normal computer to india and today whole world is looking at india to operate the computer and build it and how to operate it give the software today after all india is at the top because in the present day technology like 18th 19th century because of the industrial revolution europe went up america went up 20th 21st century because of this new technology you are finding indians everywhere almost 60% of the software where industry of the world is in the hands of indian today so from begging a computer in 1980s india has reached here so that is where in when you think india's place in committee of nations you have to see where we are today and where we were in 1947 or 1980 because if you suddenly start comparing somebody who is there since 17th century it would be unfair comparison always so now we are helping as i said in 80s asking for a small pitch tip of computer no you don't deserve the computer that was the answer indians are still living in stone age computer is very sophisticated thing yes that was spoken computer is very spoke but now i don't want to get into that what is the net result of it people claim nobody knows what where the reality lies nasa is managed by at least 33% indians are people of indian origin people of indian origin means those who went from india settled there and have taken for various reasons american nationality but that is what the fact is that 30 to 33% nasa scientists are from india the first generation indian who have moved to america from 1980s till now you may be certainly knowing that almost 35 to 40% of the british and also american health industry is looked after indian so also the various you know some of the best known industries are headed by indians be it google be it pepsi be it microsoft be it many adobe isn't it you must be knowing that these are big barclay banks these are big industries headed by indians who completed their study in india went to america and europe and they are there in you know hadron collider you may be knowing this name hadron collider at the border of you know france and switzerland where this you know colliding of the atoms are being done there 12% of scientists are indians indians just went there in last 20 years so that is where we have reached and when you look at 1947 our economy as i said that in global trade it was less than 1% total gdp was 2% reduced to 2% we did not have the agricultural product and actually we had to import a lot and lot of food grains to feed our people 
But what has been most remarkable is in 1960s, under PL 480 program, those who are senior sitting here, they will know what PL 480 program was. India had to buy from America wheat, but wheat was never, wheat and grains were never released one year or whatever we bought one year, two years quota. They were released weekly installment. Can you imagine for a population like India, weekly installment of food grain were released from, by Americans? And there will be something or other, you have done this, we don't approve. You have uh, stood by you know, Moscow in the United Nations, we, we don't approve this. You have done this, we don't approve this. That was the kind of thing India had faced. I'm very proud to say this and share with you. Today, India is not today, is from 70s itself. We started exporting grains rather than getting weekly installment from America. In Washington, Indian ambassador had to go every week to office concern and speak to president that please release the weekly installment, otherwise our population will stop. It was a big lesson. We learned it. By 1970s, not only became, we became self-sufficient, we started exporting. And look at today, we are one of the largest exporter of food grains, one of the largest in the world. And I'm very proud. Our friend, Russia, always stood by us. And even now, without caring for anybody, they come forward to us and we go to you. That's pride. And <clears throat> one thing that has to be mentioned very clearly when we talk in terms of production economy and all things, recent example, not anywhere else. Russia developed COVID vaccine. America developed COVID vaccine. And third country was India. Nobody would have expected that India will develop. But we are also very proud that we provided to third world nation, if you want to call them, I don't want to call them third world. I will call them poor nations. We provided all poor nation entire vaccination free. The industry worked day and night. We did not charge a single penny for providing the medicines for all the poor country because we have known what the poverty is. We have known what the death is without medicine. We have known that even if something is available and you don't have the money, what it is like. So this is what you call civilizational ethos, civilizational learning and civilizational value. We never said, like somebody said, oh, we will first take care of our own people. And if there is something left over, we'll give. No. We said, as we produce, part will go to our people, part will go to the world. That has always been our motto, that we live in a world which is like a family and every member of the family has to be taken care of. And world is a family, that is how we behave. And as you know, as you know, that what I'm speaking is yesterday's statistic, yesterday's news, not very far. Very quickly, I'm rounding up. When British left India, in 1947, India had only 20 universities. Almost about half of them good ones, the rest are just to give the degree. Or produce the people who will work for British as a clerks, as accountant and all that. So universities were never meant for education. They were meant for training people who will be part of the operators. But you know what today? Today, 625 government universities are there. In the last, last 75 years, 625 government universities, first rate. And then 421 are private universities. Take all of them together, you are nearly 1,050 universities today, rather than just 20. And universities do not include 
higher learning like technical engineering medical business management these are almost about 2000 and you are aware that some of them are the best known institutions in the world i'm not going to nom them we can always take them up in the discussion because i i, I will be leaving that and i'm sure that i would love to answer more frankly in q and a rather than coming here and i just said 75 years achievement in the world india in the world surely be it nasa be it medical be it management be it finances and so on india has made a big place something which was not started in 1415th century oxford and cambridge which was exported in 1947 which was not started 200 years back in america either harvard or cornell it started just 75 years back and look at where we are in terms of civilizational values in terms of civilizational ethos in terms of civilization achievement i mean i there is a saying any amount of money you can earn but beyond the point it's of no use if you have a million you can buy a car if you have 2 million better car you have 5 million buy a jet what will you do with billion it's of no use to you at all even if you want to use it if you have a five bedroom bed bedroom how flat you can buy a house for five acres but if you buy 500 acres house are you going to use those 500 acres that's where the philosophy lies beyond a point everything is worthless for you everything is of no use for you and that is where civilizational values and ethos say caring and sharing if you have something with you learn to share and with that sharing care now <clears throat> i will come to something you may have been expecting why i am not touching <clears throat> that is on international affairs i would love to answer that much more than speak here but there are few things i would like to say india has always talked about a middle path talked about not joining any block and group but also there has been no hesitation in me in my heart in saying that we have always stood by humanity we have always stood by more concern and definitely over capitalism we have stood against capitalism there is no doubt about it i am very clear about it but in recent past as i said that it has been a long tradition in indian diplomacy but in recent past very clearly we have been able to convince everybody that terrorism has no place in the society, human being in human society terrorism has no place in human values terrorism has no place in human civilization and also very successfully we have been able to convince there is no good terrorism and bad terrorism terrorism is terrorism you know there has been a concept being sold or right, there is a good terrorism there is bad terrorism we have to isolate bad terrorism a knife being used to kill whether it is made of stainless steel or it is wrought iron how does it matter is killing anyway so terrorism good terrorism and bad terrorism well it has no it has no meaning we have always been against the war and we have always said things should be sorted out on the discussion table there is a beautiful couplet i will explain you it's in hindi it's a beautiful poetry two lines jang to khud hi ek masla hai jang maslon ka hal kya degi war itself is a problem how war can give the solution to the problems war itself is a problem how war can give solution to the problem therefore o oh civilized men avoid the war come on the table and discuss the problem we have always also 
always been against unnecessary intervention of certain countries, certain people, certain thing. Provocation for no reason, unnecessary intervention, trying to belittle someone, trying to disintegrate someone, trying to create problems for someone. We have always been against it. And I think <clears throat> we shall always be against it because we respect not only sovereignty of every nation, but also we don't approve outside intervention to create trouble and problem. We know where the outside, I'm sure that you understand what I mean by outside intervention to create problem among the neighbors, among the countries, friendly people. We are very much against that. India has never, you are witnessing that. Throughout the history of India in say 9,000 years of continuous history, India has never had the territorial ambition. We have never sent our armies anywhere in the world and we are against it. Many countries have started claiming, this is my area, this is my area, that ocean is my ocean, this sea is my sea and on so on. And quoting various historical things. Well, we are all against it. Our prime minister have said many times and intellectuals have just five minutes. I'm almost getting over. We believe that dialogue <clears throat> can build bridges. Even the opposite people can sit on table. You have shown the great evidence of it. Warring people can sit on table and still sort out and dialogue. You have shown it and we appreciate that. Nations should learn to talk across. And one thing is more. Very quickly, we have also altered the meaning of neighborhood. Not necessarily a neighbor is always a friend. Not necessarily a neighbor is always well wisher. Well, India has learned a lot of lessons from its neighbor. But look at some of the best friends, best neighbor are the ones whose geography is not in consonance, not touching India be it Russia, be it Middle East. You just imagine India has 1,000 flights to Gulf countries, 1,000 flights per week. I'm talking, just imagine the my, people coming, 1,000 flights, uh, flights per week. Are they better friends? Or who is just beside my house and doesn't speak to me? Throw dirt at me, is he a better nation? So we think, that we have altered this meaning, friends can always be somebody who, can, who is distant and not necessarily he's touching your border. And that's experience for everybody. It's better that if somebody's house is nearby me, somebody's boundary line is touching me, we are better neighbors. But unfortunately, that is not happening. And one cannot be friend and a good neighbor if you are constantly creating trouble, if you are constantly, you know, needling people, constantly doing something which is not in interest of people and civilization. <clears throat> now, India has tried its best that not to remain uh, India has tried its best to remain very independent, but at the same time, independent, not unreasonable in, to the level of reasonability. And that is why it has stood by certain things which we think are great. And recent example, I will tell you, you are aware, the kind of pressure that has been exerted upon India not to buy Russian things, including oil and gas. India said, no, we have to look for our friend. And at the same time, we have to look for our own economy. We have to think in terms of who has been large term friends and what is best for economy and whatever may be, we are not going to stop that. And finally, what happens? If you don't listen, don't listen because we have seen the sanction on us in 1971, in 1974, 
when the nuclear explosion took place, 1998, worst sanction put by America and all other people, we have seen them. And we know this time when we were threatened that if you don't stop buying crude oil, we are going to put sanction on you. We just laughed at it and said, go ahead with it. Our country is our country, friends are friends. We will stand by it. <clears throat> Ultimately, you know, we always like to utilize our own tradition. And that is where I said, peace is responsibility of everyone, not just every nation. Peace is the responsibility for of every individual also. You may not contribute in terms of peace with nations, <clears throat> but you can always contribute, contribute peace with your neighbors, with your friends, with your well-wishers, and all those you have known. And that is where you say, let us work for peace, make this earth better for the living of not just human beings, but all living beings, because as a nature lover, I'm very perturbed that in the last 250 years, only population that has increased is human being at the cost of all other things, living or not living. Time has come. We have to think in terms of those also who are being wiped off because we are increasing. Thank you very much for all your patience, for all your attention. I'm grateful to all of you to have given chance me to speak. And all that I wanted to do was when you start looking at India where we are, take the datum line where we began. Thank you very much, Professor Lukin. I'm so grateful for your such invitation. Thank you very much, Professor Lal. This is very fascinating indeed. So um, as you as you suggested at the beginning, um, a little bit sermon-like as well. <laughs> um, <laughs> Thank you for that. So, uh, Professor Lukin, would you like to um, um, have the first comment? Well, thank you very much, Professor. Well, um, you are brilliant as usual. I understood, of course, from the when I invited you that you are uh, mo mostly a historian and even archaeologist uh, and uh, expert on cultural issues. And on the surface, it looks like you do a bit different things from us uh, because we are mostly here in uh, international relations and politics. But then if you think really about what was uh, Professor Lal saying, it's, it's actually is political because in contemporary world, when you say why th why, uh, wise things out loud openly, it is a political act because you fight idiots and the, uh, the the idiotic majority and therefore you 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 kind of defend uh, the intellectual minority and that's of course a political act already it's a human rights act uh, and also i heard for example <clears throat> even some criticism of some countries that for example violate other 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 nations territorial integrity uh, and uh, are not, uh, you know, kind of uh, pluralist enough in contemporary world. And but you have, but it was put kind of in very Indian way. So you 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 need to be subtle enough to understand that, of course, all this criticism was directed against our Western foes. <clears throat> so, but. I have also a question for uh, for you because I'm a sinologist and um, in China studies. So, what do you think about like other non-Western civilizations? Uh, like, uh, how are you going to deal with China? Because it's also a kind of uh, mm, very, very 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 unique kind of civilization and comparable to India and you are neighbors and you, you, you'll have to deal with it somehow uh, in the future. Well, thank you very much for kind words. And 
it's very kind of you to say that I do the things a bit differently than what you do. Well, it is more cultural and the way we have been brought up and the way we have been educated. And you know, the mind and language do get controlled by civilizational ethos and the way you have been brought up. So there is no problem. And uh, yes, I many times I make political statements, you are right, but in my own way. And since I'm not interested in politics, but I am interested in political matters. As far as China is concerned, there are two countries which are matter of concern for us. China and Pakistan. Both these, in the last 75 years, we have done everything to be friendly with them, but each and every tenets have been you know, violated by them. Even a couple of days back, China came to Tawang in Arunachal Pradesh. You see, it's not really in the fitness of the country nation relationships that on the basis of some map you drop somewhere, on the basis of some literature you drop, you start saying, Ki Indian Sea, this portion is mine. Vietnam, this portion is mine. India, this portion is mine. Ladakh is mine. How long will you go from here? China's civilization begins actually 1300 BC, you know, but between 1300 and BC, 1300 BC, almost about 700 BC, for 700 years, it's all completely a dark history. Nothing is very certain during that period. Indian history begins from Vedas from 7000 BC till date uninterrupted. China is also uninterrupted from 700 BC. But what I'm saying is, in 21st century, can anybody sit, can Italy sit with a map of Roman Empire and start talking to Europe that this is this, this is this, this is this? China's problem from India point of view and also from you are better placed person to understand and also speak about it, but it's problem with Cambodia, whether it is for Vietnam, for Laos, for all other countries, including India, is the territorial expansion, that ambition. I think people have to come out openly that 21st century is not the time for army, sending army, territorial expansion. You know, I will quote Chinese ambassador in UNO. I think it was in 80s or sometime. You will know that. Chinese ambassador said in UNO that India conquered whole of China, Vietnam, Japan, Korea, all that without sending a single soldier. He was talking about Buddhism. And then he said, that's kind of cultural conquest and we need to look at that. So somewhere that's our feeling. And uh, I personally feel that almost same is the feeling for Indians. And Indians are not necessarily part of government, part of policies, but they have their feelings. Thank you. So do we have any other question? Uh, Professor Sergei Trush, I think, would like to ask a question. Uh, thank you, Professor Lau, for your very uh, comprehensive and very passionate uh, uh, a, a take you have on your country. Um, um, my question is, uh, well, uh, India is uh, a country with uh, big diversities in many uh, realms of uh, its uh, as a country. It is very diverse population. Uh, 
we can see the <clears throat> religious, uh, territorial, geographical diversities, economic diversities that were uh, just the face of your country. At the same time, as you mentioned in and very um, <clears throat> confidently articulated in your talk, India has a big progress in uh, making the country be uh, united, be uh, strong in the sense of uh, overwhelming uh, all those factors of diversity, political, social, religious. Uh, my question is, uh, uh, Russia in, uh, of course, not in the same capacity as India, but also very diverse country. We are the big country. Uh, we have uh, also uh, different religions in the country. We have very different, uh, <clears throat> economic landscape in, in, uh, in the country. We have different uh, climate and geography. What would be your advice for uh, Russian further development being based on the political and social experience of India to Russia to uh, tackle these problems and to stepping to further cohesion and development. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Sajay. It was uh, very kind of you to have said such things. My talk may have appeared passionate, but I try to make that passion full of truth and data. I know that many times when I read and when I read the incorrect description, you know what I mean to say, I call them fly-by-wire scholars. You know, fly-by-wire is the normal terms used in <clears throat> aeroplane industries. Fly-by-wire is you come stay for a week and you become expert on India. And then you expect your opinion should be respected and not somebody who has spent lifetime in the understanding. So if I look at from that point of view, I, I'm grateful that you appreciate the diversity and Indian traditions. I can tell you that this is not something cultivated. In Indian society, Rig Ved, everybody accepts that it's oldest book of humankind and uh, oldest book of humankind and what we find very clearly two very great statement. One is ekam sat bahuda vitra vadanti. Truth is one. People approach it from different directions. Therefore, they all have to be respected. Meaning thereby, my way is the only correct way is not fraud. No, it's not true. Everybody has to be. So, you know, civilizational ethos travel for centuries. Second thing is from same Rig Veda, one family, entire world is one family. Therefore, di discrimination did not come in mind that this is you, this is me, because that's a strange phenomenon which goes on for millennia. And it is part of your teaching, it is part of your belief, it is part of your inculcation. It become part of that. Just look at this. First church that was made outside Middle East or wherever, Christianity was born, was in Kerala. First mosque recorded. First mosque outside Saudi Arabia was built in India. When people were persecuted in Iran, Zoroastrians, they were forced to convert into Islam. They came to India for the shelter. 
So in a way, this age old tradition of welcoming everyone, respecting everyone has got into the blood. Somehow it just doesn't come that you are different. And Russia has, in my view, done extremely well in assimilating its population so diverse. One thing very much there, I am of the opinion and I will point it out to you also other part of the world. One may say, oh, there are two Indias. One India is New Delhi, other India is in villages. There are two New Yorks. Those who have traveled to New York, they know Madison and Fifth Avenue are different than Lower East Side. And then when you go to little bit few 50 kilometers away from New York, then you can see other USA also. Same is the case with London. You look, you look at the, some of the areas, you know, St. Pancras areas and many other areas. It's a different London. It's not the same as Highgate. Same will be with Russia, same will be in India, same will be in China. There can never be all the entire population at one level. We have to accept that. And that is where I will call it not, it's called economic disparity. There will always be there. We, what we can do is to, we should work very hard to reduce the disparity as much as we can. And that is where <clears throat> there is a Upanishad. Upanishad is about, almost about 3000 years old. And their dialogues goes on between a learned man and common man. Imagine 3000 years back. And that great learned man says, how can you sleep? if your neighbor is empty stomach. Think of these such dialogues. How can you sleep if your neighbor is empty stomach? I can't see it here, but it is my government of India's notification. Again, reiterating uh, 1960 act. And today again reiterated, it is in my mobile, I can send it. Dogs, street dogs not to be harmed. The dogs who are living on the street, they're not to be dislocated. They have as much right to live on this earth as a human being. You may have paid the price for earth that was not created for you alone, that was created for everybody else. Where can the dog get the money to pay for it? But they have the right to play. And all this has been part of our cultural thought. And you just imagine, there has been a few days back, a little bit argument with the society I'm living in because there are 12 street dogs I feed. They are all the time around me, my house. So other people is having trouble. They filed a case against me and I told the police that here it is. I have a right to feed them. They don't have the right to throw them away. They cannot change even the street. That's the law of the land. Dogs living in front of my house cannot be dislocated 50 yards away. No. If you are having trouble, society is having trouble, make shelter for them. So there are certain things, and I'm sure that with the experience of others, India and many others, you will be able to sort out all your problems. And I have no doubt, Russia will get back to its old glory. I have no doubt that Russians are proud of their heritage. They are proud of their diversity and they would like to retain the diversity as a model in the world that here we are not divided. Just look at the Europe, linguistic division, faith division. You know, if you look at the Carolingian empire and later thing, empire is state getting bifurcated to divide the system among the brothers. That has not been the case. And that has not been the case in India also. So from these experiences, you can always see, always there is a, you know, come April, April starts the hot month. There will be thousands and thousands of appeals, requests around all over India, right from prime minister to local thing. Please keep a pitcher of water on the outside for dogs, for stray things, and even for birds. So that concern is there. So I have no doubt that uh, you will achieve that cohesion you are looking for. 
Thank, Thank you. you very much, Professor. Thank you. Very, very wise and uh, very, we also feel confidence in that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we have another another question, which is a topic for another lecture, but let's try. Um, good evening, Professor Lal. What should be the policy of India to contain Pakistan from interfering with the sovereignty of India? <laughs> <laughs> Kautilya once said, Kautilya was the fourth century greatest political thinker till date. She said, he said, sorry, and Professor Lukin must be knowing, you must also be knowing them, Kautilya Zarsas. He said, talk is the best way to sort out the problem. If it doesn't work, involve friends to sort out the problem. If that also doesn't work, satam satyam satecharet, then use the weapon with which other understands. So you talk particular things, how to deal with it. As I said, talk one to one, sit on the table, sort out the problem. If you can't talk, doesn't work, involve friends, involve everybody. And if that also doesn't work, then talk in language, the person understands. I hope Olga, you understand. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, we have Alexei Zakharov who has a question as well. He's an expert on India. So please, Alexei. Hello. Hello, Alexei. Good evening, Professor Lau. Thank you for your very interesting lecture. Um, uh, you spoke a lot about the colonial period and a very uh, bad legacy of the uh, British Empire. So my question is, to what extent this legacy uh, is a burden for the contemporary relationship between India and the United Kingdom? And to what extent it affects uh, the contemporary relationship between the two countries? Because on the surface, it seems that uh, the political relationship is quite good. It's not at the level, it's not comparable to the relationship with the United States and other Indian strategic partners, uh, but still it's progressing well. Uh, people to people ties are in many, on many accounts are unprecedented. Uh, you mentioned Shashita Rur, who is often quite critical about, uh, about Britain, uh, but at the same time, he's often invited to the leading British universities uh, to criticize the British actually. So uh, uh, what, what is your opinion on this question? Thank you. Well, I'm very happy the way you put your question. And in fact, you answered also part of it, or mostly. <clears throat> yes, we, we are burdened with colonial past. But colonial past is not as big a burden as colonial historiography. Because past can be overcome. But problem is with historiography, if you continue colonial historiography, it lingers on and it keeps hammering on your head all the time, bad things. So there has to be a kind of approach, colonial history has to be written correctly. I am always of the opinion that we do not live in history and we must not live in history. We must learn to live with history. It is no harm. It's not a harmful thing to know your past correctly, but not, it is harmful to live in the past. So colonial hangover is not there. We, if colonial hangover was there, how could I have been a professor in Cambridge University or senior fellow at Clare Hall and first Charles Wallace fellow? Or I have been at least from 1986 to 2003, almost every year I went to Cambridge or Oxford or Southampton or London. Relationships are best. best. Even in those days, remember, even in those days, when India got freedom, much against the cries of Churchill, you know that as a historian, colonial, much against Churchill shouting, abusing, much against his desire. You know, when Lord Mountbatten went back to England, Churchill was the opposition leader. He went to shake hands and Churchill refused to shake his hands. I will not forgive you. You destroyed British Empire. 
you recall that comment of churchill churchill was against giving freedom to india but the very same churchill when jawaharlal nehru goes to england invited to the dinner of the was it king perhaps and churchill shook hand with nehru and you know what he said i can't believe this man does not show even a trace of hatred towards me for what i have done for india that's churchill's own word i am amazed keeping good relation has always been part of indian tradition and not to think in terms of you know revenge revenge has never been part of indian tradition our effort has always been best not necessarily very comfortable you know we can eat together dinner and it may appear very nice for everybody else around the table but we not be very comfortable between two of them who are having dinner and sipping wine so that kind of relationship can be sometimes seen between britain and india but by and large we try to put our past behind and for us future has always been more important for us and i will once again go back how the puranas define history puranas are the ancient indian literature almost computed 2 and 1/2000 years back look at the way they define history they say that when you see the flood light right from front you get blinded you can't see anything front look at the simile a flood light right from front coming to your eyes you get blinded you can't see anything but if there is a light from behind dark night light coming from behind if you you can see miles ahead purana says that is what the history is all about that is what the history is that you look forward from the light from behind look forward to your future build your future in the light of what was your experience in the past so i have no doubt one of the best tradition that britain and india enjoyed was continuation of education given to british have continued that there may be certain reasons for that that need not to be said here but we do look forward uninterrupted journey together for a long time and same is with russia we do look forward to uninterrupted journey for long long time to come thank you thank you very much professor la so um out of the uh the names of uh, great people of indian uh, should say legacy you didn't name one of them uh rishi sunak <laughs> it's just a bit surprising <laughs> um so um i think i believe professor lekin wanted to ask a question about that <laughs> yes i just wanted to ask uh, what people think about this uh like how how do they see the this uh, idea that uh, uh that britain the former you you were talking about co colonial times that uh, the former metropolis is run <laughs> now by an indian and the ethnic indian and hindu uh, by the way he was not born in india as i understand but i think a proper hindu should be born in india actually but i'm not sure <laughs> can can <laughs> you go out outside india and be a hindu that's, that's so how do they see this person no. in this situation so look in you know i cannot speak for indians i can speak for myself for this opinion i mean if, if on my statement somebody gets angry at least only i will be held responsible not the entire indian population so i can speak only for myself on this question you are very right i think sometimes we indians overreact out of enthusiasm out of thing like kamla harris oh indian 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 are yaar kamla harris grand mother great grandmother had gone to west indies what is the connection between you you have no contribution in making kamla harris a kamla harris except maybe a few genes sent from you know being carried to west indies 
That's not the contribution making care. I, that's how I look at Sunak. Sunak's father migrated to, you know, some Africa, Uganda, perhaps. There, he was from Gujarat. He settled there, did a lot of business, migrated to Britain. Sunak was born in Southampton. You see, one need not to be born in India to be Hindu. One need to be born to a Hindu is a Hindu. Because we don't have the concept of, you know, fornication or baptism. You are a born Hindu, matter ends there. So you are born in India, you are born in Moscow, you are born in London. If born to a Hindu parents, you are a Hindu. You cannot adopt Hinduism. Nowadays, people are adopting. Russians have a big population with Hare Rama, Hare Krishna, and Hindu, and all that. So also American. That is another matter. But An Sunak, he's a Hindu, born Hindu. He's not Indian. All Hindus need not to be Indian. So let us do it this way. Look at this way. Sunak is Hindu, but not an Indian. I'm not using but the word Indian Hindu. What's, what's an Indian then? Huh? But is that the same thing, being Hindu and Indian? What's what's the difference then? Who, who is an Indian then? No, in India, in India, there are other people also living. Muslims are living, Christians are living, Parsis are living. They are also Indians, and they must say that we are Indians. After all, you have to realize that Sunak, I am saying he is a Hindu, but I am not saying that Indian. Similarly, you said that who is Indian then? Hindus are Indian, but at the same time, all those who are holding passport of India, they are Indians. You will agree with this. They cannot say that I am not Indian. They may not be Hindu. So Sunak may not be an Indian, is not an Indian, he is a Hindu. That's my opinion. Not necessarily I am expressing many, many, many Indians, billions of Indians saying, oh, now an Indian is Prime Minister. No. In my view, a Hindu is prime minister, not an Indian. Okay. Thank you very much. So um, I think we don't have any more questions in the chat, but if I may, I could, um, as a historian myself, could um, uh, could ask another one about colonial experiences. So Olga, the last Olga we have to be a little bit brief because at eight o'clock I have to be in Uganda. On, All right. Uh, on this <laughs> uh, well, <laughs> basically the question, yeah. Because um, today is Sardar Patel's uh, death anniversary, and there is a program on Sardar Patel, okay. the first Prime Minister. But anyway, I will do it, please. Would you like to finish, or do we have time for another? No, one? no, no. I will yeah. take up your question. How okay, can thank I? You very much. You know, how can I miss this opportunity? You know, facing a question <laughs> from you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Um, so, um, just because you spoke about colonial experiences um, um, of of India, um, that sort of. Uh, there's a, a bit of a parallel for me there between um, Japanese colonization of Asia, namely Korea and uh, Taiwan yeah. as well. Um, and these two colonial experiences, I mean, Korea and Taiwan, are quite different from one another because the Taiwanese now um, say that Japan is their number one favorite country and country of destination and just in general their favorite foreign country and with Korea you know it's uh, it's drastically different so and in both uh, cases um, there were um, you know Japan left some um, institutions um, did something for the economy arguably some people um, even among Korean scholars they write about um, you know Japan having a positive impact on the economy for instance um, but but Overall, the attitude, attitude is very negative um, compared to Taiwan. So what is it, in your opinion, that makes a colonial experience uh, be perceived as positive or negative? Because in India, I think the situation is a little bit um, ambiguous. There are people who are sort of uh, uh, have like almost positive memories of that. And then there are those who are drastically um, against this. So, yeah, thank you. You see, in my view, <clears throat> experience of colonialism, good or bad, it has certain parameters. And the first parameter to qualify for good is not the violation of values and family traditions and women. All around the world, all around the world, family tradition, values, and women. They have always been the question of civilizational pride, and not to be violated 
if you want to retain a good memory of the colonialism. I think somewhere something has gone wrong. I would not like to get into that, do you know better? And second part is, if you cannot build up their economy, don't destroy that. Gandhiji always said, take only that much, which doesn't make the canal dry. Keep the canal running, keep the water running. If you draw up everything, it dries off and dies. Don't allow the things to die. And therefore, two things. Don't allow the things to die, be it economy, be it tradition, be it civilizational values, and don't violate. And you know what I mean by don't violate. It's inhuman, considered in all civilizational ethos, and especially in India. It's not only inhuman, it's inconceivable. And the only punishment that has been prescribed in the pantheon, in the books, is death penalty. You can't believe anything not less, nothing less than that. Violation. So always the experiences of different societies are different. And in the light of that experience, people form their opinion about colonialism. And that is why you have to look carefully what was Japanese, Japanese conduct and behavior and this, and what was Taiwanese. And then only you can really see what kind of memories have been preserved. And always remember, bad things have longer, longer, longer memory. Because it, we say those things dry a scar on your mind and heart, not just on skin. Skin scars get cleared very quickly. You forget them, but not the scars in mind and heart. And that is where you have to avoid those scars. Thank okay. you. I think yeah. on this note, we're going to conclude this. Thank you so much, Professor Lal, for um, your wise words. Um, I think we all enjoyed it very much and many more people will watch this recording after that as well. Thank you very much. It has been a great pleasure to be with you all and I enjoyed talking to you, believe me. I enjoyed, relished it. Thank you, Professor Lukin. Hope to see you sometime soon. Sometime soon. Thank Allah. you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye.